Next session will start in another couple of minutes. The next session is by Dr. Tapan Jain on K-means clustering and its applications. We'll start in another couple of minutes, in another two or three minutes. Good morning, Dr. Tapan. Uh, thank you for joining on time. Uh, we will start in another couple of minutes because uh, there are only 15 participants as of now. So maybe because this is a first session, we'll start in a short while. Okay, thank you.
Dr. Kapan? Dr. Kapan, are you there? Can we start, Pooja, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can start. So, a very good morning to all the participants. Uh, Dr. Tapan needs no introduction as he has already been uh, taken to a session yesterday. So, today he would be talking about K-means clustering, that is the unsupervised clustering algorithm. I gave the introduction for the supervised and the unsupervised learning algorithms in my first session. So he would be talking about the unsupervised clustering. And uh, yesterday it was all supervised and today it will be all unsupervised. And in the next session, we will talk about neural networks, uh, which you can consider to be as semi-supervised. And uh, in, in, the third uh, in the fourth session, we would be talking about uh, moving object detection in a video by Dr. Santosh Viparthi. Who would be using uh, the uh, who would be giving an application of uh, CNN? So please don't miss any of the sessions because all the sessions are very important and uh, they have been uh, tackled at a very after a lot of thought process. Uh, these sessions have been taken. So please uh, and be attentive. That uh, that's what I would like to have. Keep uh, be interactive. Whenever you have any questions, please uh, ask the questions to the speakers to the uh, to the uh, to the trainers either through chat box or by unmuting yourself. That would be useful in both the ways for the speaker as well as for you, because this is online and we cannot see the faces. So, uh, interactive sessions are always welcome. 
thank you so, uh, so much, Dr. Tappan, for accepting the invitation. And now it's over to you. Thank you, Pooja, ma'am. I hope I am audible and my screen is also visible. Yes, yes, sir. So very good morning to one and all present here. And uh, uh, today in this session, we will you know, focus on unsupervised learning algorithm and especially in unsupervised learning i try to you know using the k means clustering algorithm right and if time permits will go for hierarchical clustering as well right so if you have any question in your mind in yesterday's sessions in supervised learning you can feel free ask or during the sessions also as madam said that we want to make an interactive session so if you have any questions any clarification just feel free you know just let me know okay so we begin with this um, unsupervised learning right so can you tell me any you know three four algorithm of unsupervised learning just can you tell me three four algorithm names Anyone, any idea? Just talking about the name only. Okay, so my request is just please, you know, brush up or review these things because uh, just if you have the only the data and apply the algorithm not suffices our purpose, our purpose is, you know, the outcome, outcome maybe in the form of maybe a project or maybe a form of publications, right? Or maybe a form of uh, some writing materials, right? Yes. So I got one answer. Uh, this data is unlabeled. Then you need to go for unsupervised learning. Very correct. Very true. Right. Okay, so uh, this is a, just a small block diagram and I can easily, you know, you can differentiate, right? In this case, earlier in supervised learning, my data is, you know, labeled and I want to predict because we have already predefined our buckets or bins or values, right? So, for example, yesterday lectures, we want to predict the class of customer. So, if we want to predict a class of customer, whether it is a light class customer or not, or whether it is a customer is default or, or not, we have only two buckets, right? We don't make it our own buckets. But in case of unsupervised learning, because the outcome or target is not available, so we never know initially how many buckets at the output. So it may be two, it may be three, it may be four, it may be five, right? So based on the similarities, we have to, you know, make a bucket. But what do you mean by similarities, right? So number one is when we apply the unsupervised learning, my data is not labeled. And number two is, Number two is because we don't fix the output. We don't have the fixed number of output sets or buckets. So we cannot apply the supervised learning, right? And third one is the very important is if you look at the diagram, right? In this diagram, we have this is my, you know, raw data, right? And if you look at the output, output is divided into, you know, three category or three parts or three cluster. So maybe you can say that maybe this, this maybe you can divide in terms of color, maybe in terms of numbers, in terms of shape, right? In terms of volume, so anything you can differentiate, but we never know the initial information. So like that, if you look at the output carefully in the slide, Maybe uh, they divided in terms of shape, triangular, or maybe a circular, or maybe a rectangular. Maybe you can divide it maybe a orange color, or maybe a green color, or maybe a violet color. Whatever. Right? So this is the one thing. 
So in this case, we start the process and we actually discover our own information. So how do we discover our own information? So the, the very easy thing is just compare with our neighbors, compare with these neighbors. So, so for example, um, in a class, uh, let's say, for example, a fifth semester EC student, how they can compare. So number one, whenever we talk about the student, they compare with respect to their CGPA or their respect to your percentage. You also divide their group in the area of interest as well. You also make a group of maybe gender, right? You also make a group of whether it is a, you know, a sport person or not. So there are so many options is available until and unless once you discover the information, then only you can segregate. So number one is we have to discover our own information. That own information, how do we calculate? So there are different parameters, as I mentioned that either you can, you know, make a difference or you can calculate the correlation coefficients, right? Or, or you can apply the some similarity index, uh, right, to gather the information. Once you gather the information, it is not necessary that in first step it is divided. So once you create your own information, so maybe this information is very huge. Let's say, for example, if you have hundred uh, data points, so what we can you know create information is more than hundred. Right. So, but this, this don't predict the information. Right. So the second step, we apply the interpretation. Interpretation means? Interpretation means we go for CGPA, we go for height, we can go for area of interest, we go for gender, we go for some other X, Y, Z parameters. So here we start the interpretation. And based on this interpretation and number of feature, you observe that, right? You can apply the different sort of algorithm. But mainly we will focus, if we talk about the student, um, most of the time we prefer their, you know, knowledge, IQ label or their CDP. <coughs> So based on that, we apply a different sort of algorithm. So one of the algorithm is K means we look into the detail. What is K means, right? Once you apply this algorithm and after one round, we again process the data. So maybe here you can say that, maybe here you can say that based on this local or own information, you can say that my data is slightly labeled, but every, but every you know interpretation this label may be changed that's why it is unsupervised and once you process the data you your data may be divided up n number of buckets so basically we have to classify this algorithm right so data is not labeled unlabeled it on not labeled we cannot apply the supervised learning because we don't know the exact number of outputs right and in this case we need to discover the own information that own information now maybe it is a global or maybe it is a local what do you mean by global or what do you mean by local so suppose uh, what happened in our institute suppose uh, okay so we have two branches let's say CSE and let's say EC, right? So let's we talk about the fifth semester. So first we make a group of fifth semester of EC and CS also. Later on, we do one thing. Our we can divide our student like year wise, first year, second year, third year. So this third year is the entire student. So maybe you can group by year wise, or maybe you can group by branch wise, right? Or maybe you can group the area of interest. Maybe you can group the hostler or non hostler, right? Maybe you can group by, you know, the local or outsider. So any, any sort of, you know, um, 
grouping you can perform based on the information. So that's why this label is every interpretation, this label may be changed. So we can call as the, this is a unlabeled data. Okay, so basically unsupervised learning algorithm is, uh, you can say, say that, automatically split the data set into groups based on their similarity. And, and, and it's vice versa also you can do it. Abhi kya kar rahe? We have 100 data points, we segregate it into the you know, 30, 70 or 40, 60 or 35, 35, 30, make a three group. You can also combine a group, right? One process. Second is anomaly detection. Usually what happened is if you observe that the most of the time when you work on the data, Right, data isn't you know almost in the same in nature. So I'll I'll tell you one important thing is if you know that. Have you heard about that uh, one two three rules? Anyone? One two three standard deviation rule. No. Okay. So what happened is basically um, this, this entire machine learning is based on, as I mentioned, that the statistical part. So suppose I have a you know large number of samples. That is this this large number is known as population. Right. So normally, if you want to predict something, right, or inherit something, so we just take out one small, you know, sample out of this. Right. So we just a uh, small value, we can fetch it. This is known as the sample. This is known as the sample. So what happened when you plot the sample? The sample always, you know, most of the time it's, you know, it's a normal distribution curve. It's a normal distribution curve. And based on this, we infer that suppose, suppose this is the height of our, you know, students. Or maybe this sample if i take the sample of my student in our institute and this height may be average height may be a 160 centimeter suppose so i can infer something that the average height of my entire institute may be somewhat the range that is known as uh, you can say there's the hypothesis testing or you can also say state that it is a inferential statistics so usually my date, my, you know, sample is, you know, normal distributed. And if I, you know, plot that, so this is the basically a mean value. This is a basically a mean value or, and the sample mean can be represented by X bar and the population mean is represented by mu. And this is what, this is your uh, mu, minus sigma to mu plus sigma this is this so if you observe that the range from mu minus sigma to mu plus sigma almost 68 percent data is lies in this range 68 percent number one point if i take mu minus two sigma to mu plus u sigma right then almost a 95 percent data is lies in that range third one is if i take mu minus three sigma to mu plus three sigma there is 99.7 percent data is lies in this so with the help of this we can you know uh, the clustering method uh, our unsupervised algorithm this is a very important application is anomaly detection or you can say the outlier, 
height, you can easily find out. So this is the one to three rule is very, very important. When you take out the data and when you plot this particular, you know, data point. So most of the data, <coughs> I can say that fall into the one, two, three rule, right? So mu minus sigma to mu plus sigma, 68%. Mu two sigma to mu plus two sigma is 95%. Mu minus three sigma to mu plus three sigma is 99.7. So this the second most important application, and basically this this we can apply in, in the financial transactions to identify the fraud transactions. Association mining means identify the set of items because we discover our own information. We can form our own group, right? And then we we can compare that group. Right, easily. So the, the this also useful for association mining. Right, based on that, we can suggest the set. <coughs> now go for the you know clusters. So if I look at if you look at that, these are my you know data points. These are my data points, and when we apply some method, this is you know the one cluster. This is known as second cluster. This is third cluster, fourth cluster, fifth cluster. So you can say that the the data point is you know divided with the help of some similarity indexes. We can you know automatically split or we can you know divide it to subgroup, right? And in this case, if you look at that, these these are these we try to make a Homogeneous subgroup. Homogeneous subgroup means what do you mean by homogeneous and heterogeneous? Homogeneous means when you split this entire data set into the one, you know, cluster, all the cluster property remains same. All the cluster property remains same. Right? So if if we form a you know one group, you know for different different properties of the data point or different different features of the data point that is known as the heterogeneous so that is you know slightly difficult to make a group of heterogeneous Excuse me. Okay. And as I mentioned that this similarity may be a equilibrium distance, maybe a correlation distance base. Based on this decision, we can you know discover the information and make our for the same. Now this is my unclustered data. I don't know whether the data properties was based on discovery. If you look at carefully, my data is divided into you know the three clusters. Right, so green one, blue one, and red one. Okay. So now we'll look at these steps to perform. Right, so basically there are, you know, a um, lot of clustering algorithm is available. 
but in this uh, session we will focus only on the key means clustering because it's a very very popular uh, clustering mechanism there are a lot of variants is available uh, but it is still you know the preferred choice for the clustering algorithm right so now other are mean shift clustering kernel key means clustering kernel sorry k mediot clustering right but will we focus on the k means clustering right so one paper is you know written by uh, professor ek jain right the data clustering 50 years beyond k means okay so now you imagine this paper has been published in uh, in, in very renowned pattern recognition letters in 2010 and in 2010, data clustering 50 year beyond schemes. So that means this method is evolved in, in the year of uh, 1960. And now after 62 years, this method is still very, very popular. Right. So, so that's why I'll choose this particular method and right, for uh, this unsupervised learning. So this is uh, Professor A.K. Jain from University of Michigan. This is one of my friend, uh, Dr. S.J. Nanda from MNIT Jaipur. And we have interacted, uh, sir, in, uh, in 2018, a very good discussion on, on clustering. How do we apply the clustering for this IoT nodes? Now, um, Again, we'll start with the key means clustering. So, as I mentioned that every time when interpret that, our label may be changed, our group property may be changed. So, so it is a kind of iterative algorithm. It is a kind of iterative algorithm. Now, the important point is we need to define uh, like K and N, we, you know, initially define the value of k similarly in this case we also define the number of clusters right or partitions so we have to define the k now <clears throat> the second step is we need to follow the concept of homogeneity and heterogeneity homogeneity means very very less variation within the cluster so almost the in one cluster almost the same data points same data point within the cluster and heterogeneity means in other cluster we have a different so we have the you know fair comparison between the two clusters so i can say that so this is my cluster 1 this is my cluster 2 this is my cluster 3 so all these data point is this so cluster number one are similar. Similar means homogeneous. But if you compare the data point to the cluster number two to one, it is you know entirely different. Entirely different means this this particular set will form a heterogeneity. Heterogeneity. Okay. So within the cluster is homogeneous. Outside the cluster, it is it is behave as a heterogeneous. Right? So just keep in mind. And the one data point, let's say for example, I have another cluster is this. So in this case, if the data point is here, so data point is strictly or, or only belongs to the one cluster only. It is not possible this particular data point is belongs to the cluster two as well as cluster four. No, one data point is belongs to only one cluster one data point is only belongs to the one cluster right so each data point belongs to only one group so number one it is the iterative algorithm number two we need to define k right so predefine the k number three it is a one data point belongs to one group number four is homogeneity and heterogeneity within the cluster we have the same kind of data point Outside the cluster, we have the different data points like that, right? And ultimately, when we write a machine learning algorithm, our aim is to minimize the cost function or objective function. So just look at carefully this. So 
argument is so our aim is to what our aim is to what uh, minimize this function so i'll i'll tell you with the help of one example here k is what number of cluster so let's say this is one this is two this is three one right so here p value is 3 let's say we have 100 data points let's say we have 100 data points so m is 100 k is 3 right mu k is what suppose in 100 let's say 15 point is here let's say for example 10 point is here 10 point is here. so almost 35 uh, you know data point is distributed. Now the 36 number data point is come into the picture. 36 data point has come into the picture. Maybe it is, belongs to this point. Maybe 36 belongs to this point. So if I look at that, this is my cluster number one, this is my cluster number two, this is my cluster number three. Now new data point has come, I have need to check the similarity. So if this 10 point number one step is we need to calculate the centroid of existing data points. So in this case, cluster number one, I have total 15 data points. So when we club this 15 data point, maybe centroid is here. When you combine this 10 data point, maybe centroid is here. When you combine this data point, maybe centroid is here. Right. So I need to calculate the distance from each centroid. So this is nothing but it is a centroid value. Mu k is what? Centroid of the cluster. So mu 1 is centroid of cluster 1. Mu 2 is centroid of cluster 2. Mu 3 is centroid. X3 means my 36 number point. Double line shows the L2 norms. L2 norms means it always shows the equilibrium distance. L2 mean, norms means L2 norm. When you write, when you read a you know research paper, they write instead of equilibrium distance, they write L2 norm. So we calculate this 36 number point and distance from each of the cluster. This, this, and that. And if the distance is minimum from cluster number one, this particular prom is you know now associated with cluster number one. So once it is associated with cluster number one, we need to, you know, modify this uh, cluster. Just a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. So now once this data point, 36 number data point is belongs to the cluster number one, right? <coughs> so, so now the we need to modify the centroid. So this centroid value and the new data point value. So maybe centroid is shifted a little bit here. Maybe like that. So this is the process. So our aim is to what? When you have the new data point is come, the distance is minimum. Right? Distance is minimum. 
and this this is a weighted factor if the distance is minimum so uh, this value is one that means belongs to that particular cluster and value is zero that is not belongs to that cluster so our aim is like that any any questions so far if you have just feel free to ask okay so we'll go to jump to the you know example part So we have this unclustered, you know, data, and we want to do the clustering. So we predefine the value of k, right? So we define the value of k, and we randomly choose the two clusters. This is cluster number one, and this is cluster number two. Then we can do one thing: we can just calculate the distance from this blue point to this green one, and this red point to this green one, right? We have calculated the so if the distance is minimum from blue color, we assign the blue color. If the distance is minimum from red color, we assign the red color. So look at the figure number B. So my, you know, now the unclustered data is initially divided into two, two halves. This is not the, because it is an iterative process. We want to stop here. It's the first step, right? Now, after this blue one, in this entire blue set, we just calculate the centroid value. So maybe centroid is fall here, right? And for the red, maybe centroid is fall. Look at the figure to see. This is the second iteration. Now again, calculate the distance. If it is close to, so this, if, for example, this particular data point. The distance from red is minimum as compared to the blue. So again, we change the color. We change the color, right? So then now we'll move to the step number three, I third iteration. So like that. Again, we again recalculate the centroid value. Now centroid is, is you know move to some dense area like that. You have to move your centroid value until and unless the distance, overall distance is minimum because our, our, we need to you know, uh, minimize the cost function, distance function. So now this, now this bifurcation, you look at the pink line like that. Again, we can recreate and after this step, we can stop here. We won't, you know, now if you look at the figure F2I, there is no change of your cluster head position. So we stop here because, because now the distance, if you change the centroid, the distance is large, right? So this is the simple step to follow, okay? Now uh, look at the example too, it is a, you know, I think you can understand easily. So now again, I'm the same question. How many features in this uh, table? How many features in this table? Just please let me know how many feature in this table. Okay, I got two responses. Shanmukh Priya, Durga Devi, and very nice. So we have only two features in this example, height and weight. So I got one more answer. Thank you. So now we want to, you know, divide this uh, into two part or three part or four parts. So we have total 12 data points, right? And then we start the process. So number one is we have 12 data points, right? We initially assume that because we need to predefine the value of k. So in this case, we already defined k is equals to 2. Okay. Now, if we assume that the k is equals to 2, that means um, two clusters 
So cluster is you know K1 and K2. This is my K1 cluster and this is my K2 cluster. Okay. Now we want to distribute this. So one way is we assume that this this first data point is you know fall into the cluster one. And second data point fall into the cluster. First data point means now if I if, if in my cluster had only one data point, so that that data point value is exactly same as our centroid value because only one data point is present. Okay. So the centroid value of this first data point is 72, comma 185. And cluster two centroid value is 56, 170. Right. Now the this, this has become our cluster head one, and this has become a cluster head two. Initially, we assumed. Now the new data point come into the picture. That is the data point three. So first we calculate the distance from cluster head one and cluster head two. Centroid of cluster head one and centroid of cluster head two, we have to calculate the distance. So first we calculate the distance from D13. We can easily calculate with the help of Euclidean distance because the D3 value, data point value is nothing but 60, 168. So when we calculate that 72 minus 60, that will come out to be 12 square. Plus 185 minus 168, that means 17 square. So 144 plus 289, somewhere around 400 something. And when we calculate the square root of that, that come out to be 20.8. Similarly, we want to calculate the data point 3 to cluster 2, this distance. 50, sorry, 56 minus 60 square, that come out to be 4 square, plus 170 minus 168 square, that means 2 square. So that come out to be 16 plus 4, that means 20, and the square root of 20 is nothing but 4.5. So I hope it is clear. So once again, I repeat here, we want to, you know, distribute our 12 data point into the clusters. So we predefine the cluster value is two. So we assume that we have two clusters, right? Now we divided all data point, 12 data point into the two clusters, right? So we do one thing. We initially assume that my data point one and two value. Right, my data point one and two is so data point one. So one cluster, one data point that it act as a centroid value. So that centroid is 72, 185. For cluster two, that centroid value is 56, 170. Now the new data point is come. We need to identify whether it is belongs to cluster one or cluster two. So we calculate the distance. So distance one three we calculated and distance two three calculated. Distance 1, 3 value is 20.8 and where is uh, distance 2, 3 value is 4.5, right? So if you look at the minimum distance out of these two, obviously the distance from 2 to 3 is minimum. 2 to 3 is minimum 4.5, right? So we have this is our cluster 1, this is our cluster 2, this is my new data point and this new data point is very close to cluster two. So now this cluster one and cluster two. So now in cluster two, now two data points. Now cluster two have now two data points. So we have to modify is centroid value. So how do we modify it? We just take the average of two values and easily calculate. So 56 plus 60, that means 58. And 170 plus 168, that is 169. So now cluster one centroid remains same and cluster two centroid is modified and its modified centroid value is 58, 
comma 169 right i hope it is clear now the next step is our new data point has come point number four you need to repeat the same step so first we calculate the d14 d14 how to calculate 72 minus 68 4 square 179 minus 185 6 square 36 plus 16 52 square root of 52 is 7.21 similarly this second cluster we can easily calculate the value 58 minus 68 10 square plus 179 minus 169 10 square 100 plus 100 200 square root of 200 is somewhere around 14.14 so obviously now you can look at what is the my minimum distance right my minimum distance is what obviously 7.21 so this fourth number data point is now belongs to cluster one. So if fourth number data point is belongs to cluster one, that we need to modify its centroid value. So average 72 plus 68, that come out to 70. 179 plus 185, average is 185. Now next, repeat this process. Now the new data point five is come into the picture. Can you quickly tell me this Point number five belongs to which cluster? Please try and just let me know. Okay, I got the answer. Thank you. Please try. If you are not able to solve this, please let me know. So what is the step? We need to find out the distance from cluster one and cluster two. What is the distance from cluster one? Cluster one, two, five. Can anybody tell me what is the distance of D15? Roughly distance, you can say that. Okay, so 70 minus 72, that means two square and under root that distance is two. Root of four, sir. Like two, sir. Yes, yes. One comma five. And then fifty-eight minus seventy-two, fourteen square plus thirteen square. That is a very huge value. Fourteen square plus thirteen square is very huge value. And then under root. So it's very high value. So obviously. You can easily predict that the data point five is belongs to data five is belongs to cluster one. And once it is belongs to cluster one, can you tell me what is the new centroid of cluster one? What is the new centroid value of cluster one? Anyone? What is the new centroid value? Okay, very nice. So average of these two, average of these two, 70 plus 72, average 71 comma 182. Okay, thank you, Sachin, sir. So this is the centroid value. And let's keep on repeating whenever the new data point come, you just compare the distance from central. So it may be two cluster, it may be three cluster, it may be four clusters. So you have to do the multiple tasks for the same. Right. So I hope now this, this is clear to all. If any doubt, just let me know. Now the there are a lot of applications of KNN, right? So if we can also use this KNN S for image segmentation. So if you look at this 
image carefully. This is suppose my original image. This is my some original image, right? So if original image size is, let's say, for example, 100 MB. Right. So you can divide split your, okay. So let's say, for example, a gray image, right? Gray image. Gray image, 8 bit is ranging from the pixel value as 0 to 255. So you can make a group. If pixel value is this, it belongs to cluster 1. If it is this, it belongs to cluster 2, 3, 4. Like that, you can do the segmentation kind of thing. Right? So these things, if you take only two value, it look like a binary image. If like, so suppose original image is 100 MB and if you apply the key means clustering, right? So this value you can take K equal to 2, 3 cluster, K equal to 10, K equal to 15, 20, 100, whatever. In the same time, if you apply only the value of 2 and the size is 100 MB, so if the value is k is equals to 2, the size is only 4 MB. 4 MB means 4%. That means 4 MB. So this KNN also used for compression as well. Not at all segmentation as well as the compression algorithm. So very good. You can easily apply where the range is fixed. If you just assume the number of buckets or bucket range, apply this process. Right? You will get a very good result in this case. Right? So one of the application is the image segmentation. Now, of course, uh, there are some limitations of k-means clustering because it is a hit and trial method and we need to, you know, predefine the key value and then repeat that process. So if you look at that, if my, you know, uncluster environment and we start with our, you know, homogeneous data set and we start, we'll take the value is one or sorry, value is two, k is equals to two. But it would be better if you take only one cluster because it's the homogeneous in nature and very, you know, it is, you know, densely deployed in one particular region only. So here, instead of k equals to 2, you will take only k is equals to 1. Like in this case, if you look at that, we assume that only k is equals to 1. We assume that okay, our, you know, data is in same in nature. But it is better if you take the value of k is equals to 2, right? So that is the some limitations of, you know, k means plus 3. Right? Now, the one more important thing is that if you compare this, this is very similar. If you turn... Um, Comparison in terms of, you know, this here part, this is, you know, slightly similar for this. But, but actually they are very, very different. In but in the feature space, they are very similar, but these, these are the very entire different images. So that is the second limitation also. Third is if we cannot apply for these, you know, circular shapes, right? If you look at that, we have, you know, fairly distributed our data point in the, this red one and blue one. But when we apply this, you know, k-means clustering for this kind of circular shape data, round shape data, my some part of, um, you know, red color, this some part of my red color now belongs to the blue color and some of the blue color is now you know, belongs to the red color in one. So that is the some limitations we cannot apply if my data is distributed in the round shape. Right. So this is another uh, limitation of my data. Right. So now, if you have any questions uh, for K-means clustering, then you can feel free to ask. Now, in KNN, we have a, you know, a simple fair rule for because of voting, we take odd value, we have the minimum value of K is equals to 3, right? Now, my question is, 
how do we decide this thing right here? Because my data is not labeled data in this case. So if you go through the literature, there are two methods to find out the value of k. There are two methods as in the literature. One is the LO method. Right, so you need to different value of k, you need to plot the distance curve. So like this, you have to make a value. So this is the uh, the optimum number of k. Suppose you will take k equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So where this curve is like this, band, you will take that value. So this is the so first method is the ELVO method. Second is the somewhat similar. Is the second is the sell out analysis sell S I L I don't know the exactly the spelling S I L H O U E T T E sell out analysis to also identify the value of. You just uh, you know, most of the time the because now the data is very dense. So if you repeat the same, same task for k equal to two, three, four, five, and then compare the answer, that is the wrong method. So better you have to first identify the optimum value of k, and then you can proceed further for your analysis. Right? So there is two methods: LO method and the sellout analysis to find out the value of k. Now, if you have any questions so far, just let me know. Otherwise, we'll move for the, the second part. Any question? Um, Sachin sir, uh, is still research possible in clustering domain? Yes, definitely, sir, because nowadays there are different variety of applications uh, of machine learning. So, yes, as, as I mentioned that this method is evolved in 1960, but it is still in popular. If you search in the Google Scholar, a lot of paper and even in 2022, you will get it. So, a lot of scope in the research domain. Any questions, please? Okay. So now I move to the second part of clustering, that is the hierarchical clustering. So many of this aware about the hierarchical clustering and that um, divided into two part. One is the divisive, another one is agglomerative clustering. Divisive means the top to bottom. Top to bottom means you have a large set of value and you have to, you know, split into the small subgroups. That is the top to bottom fashion. Agglomerative means bottom of fashion, bottom to top. Bottom to top means we have these small subgroups, right? So n number of subgroups, we have to combine this. So that is the agglomerative. Divisive or agglomerative is, you know, used for mobile communication, right? Both the techniques, I will tell you. Okay, so suppose I am in here, is in uh, Nagpur, right? And uh, I want to make a call to my friend in Delhi. My friend, okay, so I am residing in, in my institute, let's say Triple IT Nagpur is the area. So there are a lot of, you know, mobile tower is there in this particular area. Okay, so I belong to this particular tower based on my, you know, provider. This, this provider may contact in my local area office to the base station to the center office like that. So multiple, you know, 
space station can combine. And after that, this is my central office in Nagpur city. Similarly, my friend is residing in, in Delhi in this, uh, let's say, model town. So again, they need to, you know, follow these kind of structure, maybe or, or wide structure because the city is fairly dense. When I establish a call, so I make a call like that. I make a call like this fashion. So this is bottom to top. And once this calls are connected to the central office of Delhi, then this call may be a distributed. So this particular approach is bottom to top and this particular approach is top to bottom when you make establish a connection. And this agglomerative scheme is, you know, most prefer for IoT and wireless sensor network. IoT and wireless sensor network. Why? Because whatever the reading will take it, whatever the reading will take it, we have to immediately give the response to the central office, right? So we cannot establish the connection from central office through to, to this particular node because a lot of energy wasted. So in wireless sensor network, we you know use this agglomerative clustering and we want to make a segmentation or we might make a group, we'll use that top to bottom fashion or division clustering. Another important uh, aspect in this clustering is we need to plot a dendrogram. What do you mean by dendrogram? Dendro means a tree and gram means a drawing. So we have to draw a tree diagram at the end of this particular cluster. So in this case, um, next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I'll take on, you know, agglomerative clustering. That is the bottom of fashion approach. And again, uh, we divided this approach into two parts, uh, right? One is in the quantitative another one is the qualitative in quantitative uh, clustering we'll go for equilibrium distance and qualitative will measure the similarity with the help of Sorensen. right so what happened that yeah, this is the our you know cluster and suppose new data point is come right so this cluster may be consist of n number of data points so one approach is what, whatever the minimum distance from any of the clusters, suppose this is minimum, and this is minimum, like that. This is a one way. So you need not to calculate the distance from each of the nodes, only any one of the node, which is the distance is minimum. If you using these concept, it fall into the single link concept fall into the single link. Second is, if you calculate the centroid of all the data point and then calculate the distance, that, that fall into the average link concept. And third one is the farthest node. If you calculate the, the distance okay, from farthest node and then associate this, that is known as the complete link concept. So we have single link, complete link, and average link. But as I mentioned that this is applicable for wireless sensor network or IoT nodes. So we we have very small energy of low power devices. So we, in this case, we merging through a single link concept. So if we get the you know minimum from any nodes, we'll assign the node directly to that cluster. Side, right? So in this case, we'll use the single link concept and draw the its dendrogram. Now, coming to the bifurcation of the quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative means we have to do the lots of processing. Every node, we have to calculate the distance. Qualitative means we just assume that whether this particular node is fall into within the range or not, yes or no. So we'll prefer the uh, qualitative mode because it saves a lot of energy. If we go for quantitative, lots of computational is involved. Right? Let's see and draw the try to draw the diagram with the help of one example. So this is a simple note. 
code we deployed in one particular region, right? And uh, so how many nodes? Uh, here we have eight nodes and these nodes are directly connected. And if you look at, at that, we have the X and Y coordinate of each node, right? X and Y coordinate of each node. So first we form a distance metric because we go for quantitative analysis. Quantitative means I have to calculate the distance from each node. And then accordingly we merge the nodes, okay? So if you look at that, node number one is connected to 258. Similarly, node number six is connected to three, four, and seven, right? Okay, so let's, you know, try to make a dendrogram. Okay. This dotted line show the direct connections. That means within the range of the connection. So this, um, this value is given. And to identify that particular location, we need to also deploy the GPS that node so also a very you know heavily power requirement in this quantitative analysis now we first calculate the euclidean distance so we have calculated distance from 1 to 2 1 to 3 1 to 4 1 to 5 and 1 to 8 right so these are the distances similarly for 2 to 3 because 2 to 2 distance is 0 and 1 to 2 or 2 to 1 we have already calculated the distance so this is a distance matrix. Now we will need to join two nodes. How to join two nodes? Just look at this table. What is the minimum distance in these, this table? Can you just tell me what is the minimum distance between two nodes in, in this table? So first we need to combine node number one and node number two. Now, once you combine this node number one and two, and as I mentioned that we go for single link, we go for single link concept. So if we go for the single link concept, so either you have to take the distance from one to three or two to three, which is the minimum. So if I look at the table TL3, one to three distance is 4.99 and two to three distance is 3.43. So any of the, either one or two, we just identify the minimum distance. So we modify this table. We remove this point because now either one or two, the distance is 3.5. Similarly, we remove this and modify the table accordingly and modify the table accordingly, right? Okay. So when we modify this table, one and two is combined. And if you look at that 4.99 and 3.54, I take 3.54 like this. So this is the reduced form. Now one and two is combined. The next minimum value is, next minimum value is 1.95. So that means we just combine the Three and six. So one and two combine, and three and six is also combined. So three to four value is 1.99, or six to four value is 2.72. So we discard this value. Three to five value is 9.12, and five to six value is 8.77. So we discard this value also. 3 to 6 already we had taken. 3 to 1. 3 to 1 is 3.54 and 3 to 6 is 3.79. So we discard this value. Similarly, 3 to 7. 3 to 7 value is 4.59. Or 6 to 7 is 2.65. So we discard this value like this. Three to 8. 7.04 and 6. Point, so we discard this value. 
ओके एंड अगेन मॉडिफाई सो नाउ वन टू इज कंबाइन देन थ्री सिक्स इज कंबाइन नाउ नेक्स्ट मिनिमम वैल्यू इज वन पॉइंट नाइन फोर तो थ्री सिक्स एंड फोर इज कंबाइन लाइक दैट दिस प्रोसेस इज रिपीटेड टिल द time all the nodes are distributed okay so now after this we have the already a uh, library in python and matlab so you can directly plot the this pentagram now one and two is combined look at that and this this x axis is the node id and y axis you are you know distance so this is the 1 and 2 is combined then 3 and 6 combined then 3 6 and 4 is combined right then 4 2 eight is combined then 3 6 4 and 7 is combined and finally this 2 is combined and last is 5 so if you look at the figure carefully the 5 is the farthest road we can say that like that you can easily identify Okay, so this is what this is my quantitative. Now we go for qualitative method. We go for qualitative method. Qualitative, as I mentioned, that you just whether it is within the range or not. So like like I'll take node number one. So node number one within the range of two, five, eight. So one, two, five, eight. The value is one. One. Two, five, eight. This value is one. Similarly, if I take node number seven, so node number seven is connected only the six and seven. Node number five is connected to one, five, eight. One, five, eight. So like that, we just construct a one-half network connectivity. matrix okay i hope it is clear we don't calculate the exact value x1 minus x2 square plus y1 minus y2 square number 1 and even we assume that we don't have the exact position of my sensor nodes right so how do we find out whether it is a range or not this is a mechanism called rssi received signal strength indicator right so this is the first step now similarity so how do we find out this similarity we can use the sorensen similarity there are a lot of similarity coefficient but if you look at that the formula of sorensen is 2m11 plus 2m11 means direct connection direct connection so it is which is to give the direct connections and 0 0 means there is no connection at all so how do we calculate this m11 m12 between two nodes so let's say for example one or two ke liye humko calculate karna i want to calculate the similarity value of between one and two okay so m11 what do you mean by m11 i need to calculate the similarity between node number 1 and node number 2 so for that we need to calculate these value M one one means if you look at the transition from one to two, how many transition from one to one? One to one means this value. So first we select one and two because we need to calculate the similarity between this, right? So look at this. This is a one to one transaction. This is also a one to one. So how many one to one transaction? Only two. So this value is two. Now calculate the value. Uh, let's say. M one two zero, one two zero is one and two, so this value is also two. And then the transition value is let's say M zero one. M zero one is transition is one and two. So two two two. Okay.
okay so now we apply the sorenson formula formula is what 2m11 2m11 means 2 into 2 divided by 2m11 2 into 2 plus m10 is 2 plus m01 is 2 that come out to be 4 divided by 8 that means a 0 0.5 so the dissimilarity between these two points because we need to plot this this is 1 minus similarity is 1 minus 0 0.5 is equals to 0.5 right so we need to you know make a table like this for each 1 and 2, 1, 2 and 3, 3 and 4, 4 and 5, 5 and 6, and you have to calculate this. So now we need to first combine the minimum value. <coughs> Excuse me. So minimum value between 5 and 8. First we combine 5 and 8. So 5 and 8, then 5 and 8 combined with 1, right? And also in between, we have to combine 3 and 6 because the 3 and 6 value is 0.11. So 3 and 6 is also, just a minute, I'll take some other. Yeah, second value in 3 and 6. Okay. So first we combine 5 and 8, then 3 and 6, then 5 and 8 combined with 0.143, that means this 5, 1, and so on. You can just combine the values, right? And you can form a delta. But it is a, you know, it requires very less amount of power as compared to the quantitative approach, right? So now, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Please uh, unmute yourself then, for you can put it onto the chat box. Any question? So please note it down my email ID. If you have any question, you can feel free email me at tapankumarjan at gmail.com. So I, I think there is no question, ma'am. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, no further questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tapan, for uh, giving out time from your busy schedule and uh, taking this session. It was really useful for all the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we'll uh, start the next session at 11.15 by Dr. Nishat Ansari. Thank you. I'm not closing the meeting. The meeting will remain the same. Can you say some tool for K-means clustering? I think Dr. Tapan has left. Uh, is Dr. Tapan there? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, what type of tool you are looking for? Uh, Shanmuk Priya, I didn't understand your question. You are saying that Python or something? You can very well code k-means clustering using Python. Shanmuk Priya? Okay, so uh, we'll meet at 11.15 for the next session. I'm not closing the meeting. 
Yes, Sachin, you have to fill the attendance for each and every session because I need to have the feedback for all the speakers. Okay, Shanmur Priya, uh, what type of tools are you talking about? Because uh, when we code k-means clustering in Python, then we use uh, sklearn and uh, numpy pandas and the th these three libraries to code it. R, you can use R, Shanmupriya, if not Python. R is also a good language for machine learning. And in fact, K-means clustering is such a, uh, such a nice algorithm that you can implement it on your own also. But you can write a C++ and a Java code also for K-means clustering. It is, uh, uh, it is possible in MATLAB as well to, uh, to write the code. And in fact, uh, machine learning problems, if you want to really understand the logic behind the machine learning algorithms, you should code it separately without using any algorithms, without using, sorry, any libraries. Without using any libraries, you should code them first so that the concept is clear and then you can refine yourself by using some libraries. So K-means clustering can be very well implemented in C, C++, Java, Python, any language without using any libraries. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so we'll meet again at 11.15 with Dr. Nishat Ansari's uh, session on neural networks. I'm not closing the meeting. The, uh, the meeting will remain the same. Okay. Thank you.